things that other words might have seemed to ignore, and it's things like human aspects of society that were still kind of considered a risk to certain yep, yep, yep. groups and the cultural change uh, might be best thing to, to kind of move forward with. So maybe not the pluralistic topic, but an important one to kind of It's a, a little better than Spanish influenza. Yeah, okay. yeah the outcome was good. All right. Thanks, Kirby. Yeah, and thanks everybody for coming out. And um, so what I wanted to do today was um, uh, we dug in a little bit over the last two years to look at uh, Montana's contribution to eradicating or eliminating polio. Um, just want to acknowledge um, my coworkers from the department um, who helped work on this project and just thank everybody for coming out and thanks the, uh, for the Historical Society for the invitation. So first thing, just want to start with a little bit of history about polio. Um, so polio, once was regarded as a rare paralytic disease of infancy and early childhood, and it crippled in individuals for centuries, way back um, in the BC era, um, before the, its infectious nature was identified. In the mid to late 19th century, there were reports of polio, or clusters of polio, um, which also was called infantile paralysis in Europe and in the US. And then in the late 1800s, in 1893 and 94, there were a number of epidemics reported both in Boston and then in Rutland County, Vermont. And once its viral origin was identified, it became clear that polio wasn't rare. It was common, um, it was contagious, and it wasn't just confined to kids. Adults could get it too. And once, as science moved on, um, and the understanding of its infectious characteristics were identified, it would enable a number of experimental vaccines to be um, developed and tested in the middle of the 20th century. So what is polio? So the word poliomyelitis means inflammation of the motor neurons of the brain and the spinal cord. And as I mentioned, in the early times, like in the United States, it was often called infantile paralysis because people thought only kids got the disease. <clears throat> so polio is caused by an enterovirus that spreads from person to person. Mainly it's from fecal oral um, uh, contact and spread. Um, it's primarily a summertime disease, and um, through the research that was done in the uh, 1900s, they identified that, uh, fortunately, there's only three types of polio, one, two, and three. If you get infected and survive from one type of polio, like type one, you'll have a lifelong immunity to it, but you won't be, have immunity to the other types of polio. Um, most of the infections, um, again, polio was common back then, most of the infections were asymptomatic and or people would have brief illnesses with fever or sore throat, <clears throat> headache and vomiting. But in the rare case, <clears throat> often less than 1%, um, where people got infected, they'd have a se severe muscle pain, stiffness of the back and neck, and as well as paralysis that could lead um, to death. And as many of you recall, pictures of like the iron lungs, so those were the severe infections. So these are just a couple photographs. They're from the archives from Chaudaire Hospital. Chaudaire treated lots of kids here in Montana in the early polio epidemics. And it's just a reminder again of, you know, kind of the hallmarks of polio. Um, crutches, braces, wheelchairs. And so these kids were getting treated and um, going through rehabilitation there. So this is, um, this figure is just a, a timeline of the outbreaks across Montana from the early 1900s um, through the 1970s. And as you can see, um, well, the first documented case in, of polio in Montana was in 1908, um, and it's believed that it, um, um, polio spread from some outbreaks that were happening in Wisconsin at that time. Um, at that time, um, uh, it took the leg Montana legislature a number of years to finally um, include polio as a, in the listing of one of the reportable conditions. So in 1913, the legislature finally added polio, tuberculosis, and whooping cough as reportable conditions. And by reportable conditions, I mean um, that if a physician diagnosed a child or adult with polio, he or she was required to report it to the county health department, and then the county was required to report it to the state health department, the goal being to help track and um, prevent the spread of outbreaks of the disease. And as you can see, um, polio, uh, it surged and it declined through the early part of the uh, 20th century. Um, you know, the, the biggest outbreak um, epidemic we had was in 1934. Um, the, actually, let me just stop for a second. The green line is the number of cases, and the black bars on the bottom are the number of deaths from polio for each year. 
1934 was the worst epidemic where uh, 321 cases of polio were identified. Um, the majority of those cases were actually here in Helena. Um, they had the largest outbreak here. But also, as you can see, um, you know, the epidemics waned and then spiked, but things got worse in the late 1940s, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 1950s. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So I'd first like to just share the, a little information and background about the first polio epidemic in Montana and the biggest one in the United States. So the first major polio epidemic in the U.S. started in New York City in 1916, in the uh, late spring and early summer. All told, um, New York City had almost 9,000 cases of polio reported and 24,000 deaths. Um, and there were numerous reports over here on the left. These are um, articles from the Billings Gazette from 1916. <clears throat> and Montana newspapers tracked the New York City outbreak pretty diligently. Um, as you can see, it was pretty serious. One in every four um, infants stricken dies from polio in New York City. So it got the attention of Montanans out here. Um, and then the epidemic spread beyond New York City to a bunch of East Coast um, states as well as Midwest. Um, and the Billings, um, Clint, or the Billings Gazette, phys um, physicians in the Billings area actually published an article in the newspaper um, giving recommendations for the community on how to prevent the spread of polio. Most of it was good common sense. Some of it, as I'll mention a few seconds, is, was a little crazy, but they didn't know how polio spread back then. And then the other interesting thing, you probably, as a public health official, you, you always want to knock on wood, but the local health officer from Billings, Dr. Arnold, um, was quoted in the Billings Gazette with um, saying the health of Billings is exceptional, things are great, we haven't had any outbreaks. So, you know, what happens when you do that? So, the next week, um, Billings starts to be part of a polio outbreak. <clears throat> so, despite all that awareness and the physician's recommendations to try to prevent polio coming into Montana, we had uh, a number of towns uh, where polio outbreaks took off. Um, at this time, for this, um, in July of 1916, there started to be seen cases in Billings, Edgar, Hardin, and then Pryor on the Crow Reservation. Um, to help coordinate efforts, Dr. Cogswell, who was the secretary of the State Board of Health, whose uh, the building that I work in is up right up the street here, is named after of him. He actually went to Billings to help coordinate the prevention and control efforts with the local public health officials. And local health officials did numerous things to try to halt the outbreak in these communities from everything from isolating ill children where they would put a placard on the house saying polio is here, um, folks were not allowed to leave the house. Um, they urged res residents to clean up their community. Um, they delayed opening schools um, because they were in fear that if they opened schools and kids congregated it would spread. And then they uh, prohibited kids from going to public places and events. So an example was they closed the theaters to kids. They couldn't go to theaters. Um, they barred kids from attending the local Chautauqua, which was a big um, uh, entertainment event. And then they also canceled the Barnum and Bailey Circus event because of the concern with spread. There was a lot of speculation in the newspaper newspapers then in Billings about what was the cause or what was causing the spread of the epidemic. And it ranged from everything from filth in the community to um, flies to cats and dogs spreading the disease. And unfortunately, um, what it led to was they hired more public health police officials and rounded up stray cats and dogs across uh, Billings and actually killed them. So that was one of their um, not well thought out strategies to help reduce the epidemic. And so in 1916 in Billings, or in this whole area, there was 111 cases of polio and 24 deaths, um, but they finally got it under control. And the other interesting thing was um, Montana and Minnesota were the only two states west of the Mississippi that had polio epidemics in 1916. So it was a little unusual that um, only us in Minnesota were confined to having those outbreaks. Um, so I wanted to come back to the timeline again and just kind of put it in perspective. So in the first part of the 20th century, um, the main things that um, it, um, made children ill and killed them 
were not polio. There were other communicable diseases. They were cancer and injuries that often led to kids being, um, um, becoming ill or be, um, dying. So one question would be is why was there so much fear and anxiety among communities about polio specifically. So one obvious reason was um, the disease would come into a community, it struck without warning. Um, some kids it would kill um, because of paralysis. Other kids it would leave se severely disabled or in an iron lung. And at that time, there was a lot of stigma associated with um, disability, not just in adults, but particularly in kids. So th that was one of the things that drove the fear related to polio. The other reason why there was an outsized fear of polio was, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment, but a, <clears throat> a national organization, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, was organized, and they were kind of masters of using media and other venues to increase awareness of the public about polio. And in some ways, that helped drive the um, kind of some of the fear and the anxiety among community members about polio, but it would also lead to the elimination of polio in the long run. So um, the other thing that happened through the 1930s and 1940s, um, there was lots of speculation in the scientific community about and pushed to actually work on vaccines. So that would hit the news, and um, it actually, in a positive way, help drive the community to say, we want to support this effort and um, try to find a way to prevent polio ultimately. And in the 1930s, there were a number of experimental vaccines tried in polio, one in Philly, Philadelphia and another in New York City. Unfortunately, both of them didn't work, and f unfortunately, both of them probably actually caused cases of polio. So. So the other kind of big player in this story is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So in 1921, before he was governor, <clears throat> and there's a picture of him up here, he developed polio, and actually um, his experience recuperating from polio kind of drove him to, um, one of his visions and missions was to help kids, particularly kids initially, um, to treat kids who are struck down with polio or other disabilities, but also to um, ultimately figure out a way to uh, prevent it. So he was kind of the vision and the leader. In 1934, he was in his second year of his presidency, and his team came up with a really kind of cool idea um, on behalf of FDR's um, uh, um, on behalf of him, and they developed an outreach and a fundraising campaign to actually raise money to help k treat kids all across the United States, whether their parents could or could not pay for their treatment for polio. And these events were, um, they were kind of, the marketing for them were, they were uh, uh, related to his birthday. So it was called FDR's Birthday Balls. Um, the, all, the events were initiated to celebrate his 52nd birthday, which was on <clears throat> January 30th, 1934. And again, all the money raised from those events would go to help um, treat kids with polio. Across the U.S., there were about 6,000 communities that actually held FDR birthday balls. Um, and as you can see here on the right, these are newspaper stories from the Daily Missoulian um, talking about the birthday balls that were being planned in Missoula at the time. So the birthday balls in Montana, they all started at 9 o'clock, and then FDR held a nationwide radio broadcast and gave a speech to all the participants to kind of cheer them on for what they were doing. Um, in the newspaper stories for Missoula, um, it, it indicated about 2,000 Missoulians um, participated in the birthday balls. They raised about $1,000, so back in dollars today, that'd be about $18,000, so that's pretty impressive. And the money went to two things. One, it went to FDR's foundation, down in Georgia to help treat kids, but the other half of the money went to the um, St. Vincent's um, Healthcare or Hospital in Billings, um, their orthopedic clinic to treat kids there. And over the whole night, um, here's a picture of um, FDR getting the enlarged check. Um, over the whole night after they tabulated how much money they raised, they raised about a million dollars in 1934, so that's about $19 million today, so it's pretty amazing. And this was, this effort was kind of the, beginning of bigger things to come for FDR. So the birthday balls were really successful. They continued through the 30s and into the 40s, but as you guys all know, so FDR had some political enemies um, lots, for lots of different reasons. And so the birthday balls started to become politicized. And so he and his ally, the, his um, co-visionary on this uh, 
um, National Infantile or Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. Um, his partner's name was Basil O'Connor. He, he was an attorney that worked with FGR for a long time. So they came together and they came up with a different idea. It was to establish the Na National Foundation um, to kind of depoliticize these efforts to raise funds. And so they established the foundation in 1937. Um, and what the goal for this was, was they um, worked to establish local chapters across counties all across the United States. Um, and the, the goal for those chapters was increase awareness about polio and raise money to help treat kids and adults with polio. The interesting thing, so in Montana, we jumped right in. Uh, Montanans um, didn't waste any time establishing chapters. Um, our first chapters were established in 1939. And the one interesting thing for me was our first chapter was in Weibo County, of all places. So, um, and then other counties that actually um, kicked off chapters initially were Mineral, Garfield, Gallatin, and then Silverbow. And so the other thing the foundation were kind of masters at were, were using the media back then to promote awareness um, and concern about polio. And they recruited celebrities and sports, um, famous sports um, individuals to carry their message. And so just a question here, one of the celebrities they recruited who was very active in, uh, in the charge was this gentleman. He's in both pictures. Anybody know who he is? He was a vaudevillian um, Hollywood star and later was in a lot of movies. His name's Eddie Cantor. Yeah, and so he's the guy who coined the term March of Dimes, which would become their long-term fundraising campaign slogan. So, all right. So back to the timeline again. Um, so in the late 40s, the foundation was putting mon lots of money into treating kids and making sure they got the care they need, as well as adults. But the, in the 40s, the foundation started to put money into medical research as well, and they pulled together a team of very um, a team of expert medical providers to kind of think through how can we uh, prevent polio in the long run. Um, so, um, and, I'll, and I'm going to move into that through this. But so they're working on that in the 40s, and as you can see, and I'm going to come back here. Um, in Montana, we had these intermittent outbreaks through the, from 1900s through the 1940s, but then in the 1940s and 50s, all of a sudden polio starts to surge. So the concern about figuring out a way to prevent this is really um, um, kind of at a heightened level. And I just want to give you an example of the, the way Montana communities mobilized to help address polio um, outbreaks before they had the vaccine. So um, in um, August of 1953, Park County and Livingston, um, was, as well as Custer County, had outbreaks occurring there. Over the course of one month in Park County, they had 13 kids that developed polio. Four were severely paralyzed. Um, they were actually transported up to Chaudaire to get treatment at, at Chaudaire from those pictures I showed you earlier. And one of the kids died. Um, the Livingston community mobilized immediately, and it was pretty amazing, the newspaper stories about how everybody got involved. Um, so they basically, they had a, a local national foundation chapter in Livingston. The um, chair of that chapter got busy and got their volunteers organized to start raising money to help treat these kids. And not only were the, was the local community mobilized, but both the state and local public health as well as the United States Public Health Service got mobilized and it got involved as well. So the public health officials actually uh, identified, uh, decided to move forward and um, implement a mass inoculation of all kids in the community who are less than 14 years of age with gamma globulin. And so gamma globulin is not a vaccine, but it was a um, intervention that could be used back then where you take serum from people who do have developed polio and then you extract the antibodies from that serum. And if you give that to some, uh, like a child who has not been exposed to polio, but who could, it'll provide some uh, short-term protection against um, getting infected. But it's only about six months of protection. So they map, um, mobilize a, a mass um, inoculation clinics for all the kids in uh, Park County. Um, and they flew in, um, as you can see here, this is the um, civil defense pilot, and they're flying in gamma globulin and providing it to law enforcement. I believe this is in Helena, and they're um, going to take it down to Livingston to start inoculating the kids. 
Um, Park County residents showed up in droves, so they had lines of kids there to get gamma globulin. <clears throat> and they had one little snafu with the um, mass inoculation program. It turned out, and it was kind of funny the way they framed this in the newspapers, um, the kids, kids in Park County and Livingston were bigger than kids on average in the United States. And so for gamma globulin, you have to give, the dosage you give depends on how much the kid weighs. And so they ran out of gamma globulin. And so um, the state health officer had to contact the national authorities and get more. And then he came back down on the night train and then they finished inoculating kids in Park County. So in all told, um, over 3,600 kids who were less than 14 years of age got um, inoculated with gamma globulin. And it actually cut um, kind of broke the chain of the spread of the epidemic in uh, Park County. So they didn't have any uh, additional cases and it uh, stopped the immediate threat. Over here is just a photograph from the Livingston Enterprise of the nurses setting up for the inoculation clinic. And then Dr. Means is the health officer. So he's the public health official that was in charge there. So next I just wanted to talk about going back to Oops, let's see, here we go. The vaccine. So I'm sure you guys all recognize this gentleman. This is uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jonas Salk. So um, Dr. Salk was, uh, uh, at the time, was working on vaccine development at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and as I mentioned previously, in the 1940s, the foundation was putting lots, millions of dollars into research for vaccine development, and they recruited Dr. Salk um, to help work on that. He was one of a team of about 20 different um, scientists that were working on vaccine development. So they recruited him from Pittsburgh. Um, the first project he worked on with a, as a team with other collaborators was the, f the first thing they had to figure out was how many different types of polio virus are there. And so he was part of the team that typed the virus um, and they figured out that there's only three types of polio virus, which is good because if there's 400, <clears throat> that makes it a little more challenging to develop a vaccine. So they knew there was only three types of polio um, strains out there. And then in the 40s, over a seven year period, basically he and his team in Pittsburgh, their sole focus was on figuring out how to develop a safe and effective vaccine. So by 1953, Salk and his team had um, developed what he believed was a safe and effective vaccine. They did some real small trials in Western Pennsylvania and basically showed that it seemed to work. It, um, kids who got immunized developed antibodies against the polio virus and they didn't find any major side effects. So that was good news. And that kind of pushed the National Foundation to say, um, they had a lot of pushback from some of Salk's competitors like Albert Sabin, but the, um, Basil O'Connor and the foundation said, we're gonna move forward and do a national trial to see if um, his vaccine will prevent polio. <clears throat> so I wanna, before I go into that, I just wanna come back to Park County. Um, so in January of 1954 in Park County, um, you know, it's likely because of the concerns and the epidemic in, in the summer and fall of 1953 that polio was on the minds of Park County residents. And so when they heard the news that there might be a national trial to test Salk's vaccine, it, again, Montana communities got mobilized and jumped into action. The um, foundation, or the chapter chair, his name was Harvey Cole in Park County, announced that the county was going to get organized and do everything they can to raise money to uh, contribute to, the Nash, or to this um, large clinical trial that might happen. So uh, going through the newspaper stories in Park, or in Livingston, were pretty spectacular. Um, it, it, or civil organizations, civic organizations and businesses, everybody jumped in. Everybody from Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, the Elks, the Moose, whatever civic organization, everybody was running events, dances, and community events to raise money for polio. And it got to the point where um, there were so many things going on that Chairman Cole basically in the newspaper said, stop, stop, stop. You guys, you're um, organizing too many things on the same day and we're competing against each other. So he asked that people coordinate through him and then they would line it out. So um, that wouldn't happen. One of the big events that happened, not just in Livingston, but across the United States were these, in the newspaper stories right here, it's the Mother's Marches for Polio. And in Livingston, these events were held all across the United States for multiple years. But in Livingston, 400 women basically 
went, they cordoned off or sectioned off the, the neighborhoods in, in town, and then they would have a group of women who would go door to door from every house, and they asked people to turn the light on or tie a scarf or something to your door handle if you didn't have a light, and um, they would take contributions for the vaccine prevention fund. Um, and this was uh, incredibly um, successful. Um, just in Livingston, they raised, for this one event, they raised almost $10,000, so that's about, uh, I'll have to see what the conversion, t multiply by 18, so that's lots of money raised just in Livingston to help support the effort. And these events were happening all across the United States. The other thing that happened was um, really good news came out right around the same time here where four counties in Montana submitted applications um, ask, or requesting to be part of the national trial um, to test Salk's vaccine. And Park County was selected as well as Gallatin County. And then a couple weeks later, both Missoula and Mineral County were selected as well. The other interesting thing um, the folks down at the Gallatin Historical Society found is, and just want to share this with you. So this photo here, this is from the Winter Festival in Gallatin County, and this cow, who looks a little alarmed, he got auctioned off for $700 to be part of um, and donated um, for the polio fund. So I thought that was kind of cute. So Mar Montana's got four counties that are going to participate in the trial, and I just want to give you a little background on, on the trial. So why, do you use, why are we using this title, the biggest public health experiment ever? So the Salk vaccine trial, it was the largest vaccine trial in the United States that's ever been done and probably will ever be done. Um, under, just under two million kids um, were enrolled in the trial in the United States. It was a massive undertaking. Um, and then I'll show you later, but um, there are some other areas of not just the United States have participated or well, but the, what really comes back to me was that they, well, let me go through this because I'm, I'm just kind of jumping ahead here. So in December of 1953, um, this is Basil O'Connor, the chair of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. In 53, after the uh, Salk's vaccines and those preliminary trials were shown to be effective, he said, we're moving forward. We're going to do a national trial. He recruited this gentleman right here, Thomas Francis Jr., who was the chair of epidemiology at the uh, University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, and he recruited Dr. Francis to actually design and um, lay out this trial across the United States. So, um, and so in December, um, Dr. Francis got rolling. He set up the evaluation center at the University of Michigan, built a team up there, and basically he put the design of the trial together, mobilized his team of staff there to help implement it, and then they recruit, worked on and recruited counties and jurisdictions across the state to participate in the trial. So from, from Montana, the other characters in this story included, this is um, G.D. Carlisle. He was the state health officer. He was located in the Cogswell building here. He coordinated efforts at the state level for the trial. And then these two individuals here, uh, this is Mary Souls. She was the health officer at the Health District 3, which was Missoula and Mineral County. So she coordinated on a local level there. And then this is Dr. Carl Hammer. Um, he was the health officer for Gallatin County, and he coordinated efforts for Park and Gallatin County. Um, so the target date for the trial was um, early, or let's see, late April or early May, and they dubbed the, the trial or that first day when kids would get inoculated as V-Day, and it meant vaccine will mean victory. Um, and it was pretty spectacular in the newspaper stories about not just how the clinical folks, the doctors and nurses mobilized, but community members, PTA, um, and just everyday citizens came together to help um, set up these uh, mass vaccination clinics to help get, get, get the kids through. Um, so in Montana and these four counties, um, the kids that were eligible were kids in first, second, and third grade in 1954. So there was about 4,500 kids eligible um, to be immunized. And so I just want to, again, put this in perspective. So Dr. Francis and the foundation, within six, no, four months, pulled together a, a national trial that would enroll almost two million kids. And then um, our Montana colleagues here, within basically two months, set up at the state and county level the ability to recruit, um, get parental consent, and then provide vaccine for kids whose parents said yes, enroll them in the trial. So it's pretty spectacular, and it's something of, of 
citizen volunteer based trial, I don't know that we could pull that off in, in, at this level these days. So it's really remarkable. So this is just a map of the areas across the United States that were in the trial, and it's hard to see, so I apologize about that, but a couple of points I wanted to make. So in the trial, there, there were two arms to the trial. One part of the trial was a placebo control. So um, kids were randomly selected. They'd either get the Salk vaccine, they'd get three inoculations, or they would get a placebo. That's the best way to test pretty much any kind of medication because you have uh, reduces bias, all this other stuff, but it's, it's the kind of the gold standard for testing um, vaccines. The other arm of the trial was an observation control, and in that, second graders in those areas that were going to participate got the vaccine, and first and third graders did not. Um, so it was a different way to test if the vaccine works. It's not quite as good as a placebo control, but it's a less, I think, for parents um, who, if you want to be in a placebo control, your kid may not get the vaccine. So you, there may be some concern and anxiety. So you can see uh, Montana chose, Montana's communities chose the placebo control, so I give them kudos. Scientifically, that's the best way to do things. The other interesting thing was, um, like two or three weeks before the trials would kick off in the United States, um, the foundation figured out they had extra vaccine. So they contacted the Canadian Health Ministry and Finland for some reason. And actually, um, regions in Finland and Canada also participated in the trial, and they had like two weeks to plan. Um, the cool part was for us, um, Alberta was one of the, our neighbors up north, um, kids that participated in the trial there. So V-Day, vaccine means victory, is April 29th, 1954 in Livingston. And just a couple things I wanted to share with you there. It started at 9 a.m., and they had the immunization clinics in two schools. It was in Winan School in Livingston and then Wilsall School north of Livingston. Um, on that first day, they had 600 kids come through and get immunized. And so they would have teams of a doctor, a couple nurses, and then a bunch of uh, community volunteers to uh, collect all the information and tabulate everything and get the kids immunized. Um, and it's really kind of remarkable. I'll show you a little data here in a second. But of the, all the kids in Park County who were eligible, those first, second, and third graders, 78% of their parents provided consent and they were in the trial. So that's pretty good. And Montana overall did better than the rest of the United States. The other cool thing is, and I don't know if anybody here was part of the trial but, or knows anybody who was, but if for all the kids who were in the trial and enrolled, everybody got a button that said, I'm a polio pioneer, which was kind of cool. That was from the foundation. They also got a small card signed by Basil O'Connor thanking them for their commitment to preventing polio. So, um, and then these are just photographs um, from Montana communities for kids in the trial. I heard somebody talking about a tick vaccination earlier, so I just want to share one thing with you. This is a little ki kid in Missoula. Um, it's hard to read the top, but he basically opened his mouth. He didn't scream or anything. He just opened his mouth, and it basically said nothing came out. The comment he made to the um, reporter was, the reporter asked him, well, how was the vaccine? And he said, it was okay. It didn't hurt as bad as the tick shot. So he had gotten tick shots for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They were given back then. Um, so that, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, and then these are kids from Manhattan Christian School in Gallatin County. And these are kids from Emerson School in uh, um, Gallatin County. And it's kind of funny to see some of these kids' faces staring at the kid in front of him getting vaccinated. Um, and that, I just want to share a little bit of data with you. So this slide just shows you the participant, participation status of kids in the vaccine trial, the placebo field trial in Montana and the United States. And just a couple points here. Um, so in Montana, we had about 4,500 kids eligible. 73% of parents consented to provide, have their kids in the trial. Um, that was compared to 61% in the United States, so about 12 point percentage points better. And then this is the, of the, the kids who were um, in the trial, how many got all three immunizations? Montana did better, 71%, compared to the rest of the United States, about 56%. So um, you can speculate why, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but um, that was pretty, pretty good. The other thing was um, there was some variation across our counties. Um, 
Park and Gallatin County did a little better on getting parental consent compared to Missoula and Mineral, and Park and Gallatin also did a little bit better in the mid-70s on getting their, all the kids having all three vaccin vaccinations. So I'm not sure why. One guess I would have was, you know, Park County, because they had that big outbreak in 19, 1953, they might have, their parents might have been more motivated. So April, May, and then June, all the kids are vaccinated, and then the real work starts. So where Dr. Souls and Dr. Hammer and the nurses and physicians in those communities, basically they have to keep track of any kid who may get polio, collect data on that, report it back to the University of Michigan's trial center. So they're basically collecting data on the outcomes of the trial. And they work on that from June through December of 1954. And then um, it took a while, but Dr. Um, Francis from the University of Michigan, he and his team started to compile the results in the spring of 1955. And in April, um, he said, we're ready to actually release the results from the trial. Um, he, they basically picked um, the 12th year anniversary or the 10th year anniversary of the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt as the date I hold the press conference at the University of Michigan. Um, so as you can imagine, across the United States, there was lots of excitement in terms of, um, did this work? Is it safe? And so on um, April 12, 1955, at about 9.20 a.m., um, the NBC's Today Show was the first to announce the results from the trial. And this slide, here's the headline from the Livingston Enterprise. So the conquest of polio is in sight as new vaccine is revealed to be safe, effective, and potent. So it worked, it's safe, and um, it's really good news. And what, if you read Dr. Francis's paper on that trial, this is Jonas Salk and Dr. Francis at the press conference reviewing the findings from the trial. But if you read his um, published paper, basically, the vaccine, kids who got the vaccine, it reduced their risk from pol paralytic polio multiple fold compared to kids who did not get the vaccine. And they found that the um, complications associated with the vaccine were minimal or none. Mostly it was sore arms. So that was really good news. Um, the other kind of cool thing that would never happen today was once the results of the trial came out, within a couple weeks, the local papers were provided with a list of the kids who got vaccinated. And so this is the Livingston Enterprise, and this has a listing of all the kids, um, me, all the kids who got the vaccine. If you were in the placebo, you unfortunately weren't in this list, but you were notified in the newspaper that if your child got weren't, wasn't in this list but was in the trial, they would be the first to get vaccine in 1955. So I have copies. I transcribed all these names um, so they're actually readable, and I have copies of that as well as copies of the paper we published on this topic, with it, which has more information. But I thought that was kind of a cool, cool way to kind of honor those kids. So the state and county health departments, are, I know for sure, in Montana, um, they were hedging their bet that the vaccine would work. So they were already preparing, if the vaccine was safe and effective, to have a plan in place to start getting kids immunized across the state. So Dr. Carlisle, or Dr. Thompson, and his colleagues were working on that. Um, in the U.S., the vaccine for the trial was made in Toronto, Canada, at Conneaut Labs. But in the background, assuming that the trial would be effective, there were five U.S. pharmaceutical companies working on vaccine here, and I can't remember all the names. So the, once Dr. Francis came out and said this works, those pharmaceutical companies were immediately working on churning out vaccine. And uh, unfortunately, unbeknownst to the federal government, or let me back up, during this time period, uh, regulation and control of pharma the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry is not what it is today. And so these five pharmaceutical companies were starting to produce salt vaccine, but the federal government didn't have its role and regulations the same as it does today. And so unbeknownst to the federal government, one, well, one and probably two of those pharmaceutical companies were having major challenges producing um, vaccine that didn't have virus in it. And so that led to a major tragedy. And, let me, and it's called the Cutter Incident. So Right after the trial ends, the results come out, pharmaceutical companies are pushing out vaccine. Um, there started to be cases of polio reported in selected areas in the United States. And so public health folks are starting to scratch their head and start, started to worry about what's going on. This included um, um, in Idaho, um, they got shipped, 
lots of um, vaccine from the Cutter Pharmaceutical Company, which is in Berkeley, California, and Idaho started to see cases of polio, and they initially had about 61 cases right after the trial finished. So the Idaho public health officials contacted, I'm sure you guys are all aware of the Rocky Mountain Lab down in Hamilton, that um, NIH lab. So they contacted two officials down in, uh, at the Rocky Mountain Lab. These uh, gentlemen are right here. This is Carl Eklund, who's a virologist and a medical epidemiologist. This is William Hadlow, who's a veterinary pathologist. So they contacted Dr. Eklund here. He immediately went up to Idaho and started to help them investigate the cases. And he collected samples from the cases as well as got samples of the vaccine that was used. He immediately came back down to Rocky Mountain Lab. He worked with Dr. Hadlow here and a small team, and they were the first in the United States to figure out, oh boy, this vaccine that was shipped to Idaho actually has live virus in it. So the Cutter Pharmaceutical, um, the problem they were having was they, their quality control wasn't good and they weren't able to consistently um, kill the virus. So they had some lots of vaccine that were going out that had live virus in it. So these folks immediately notified um, the National Institutes of Health as well as, um, oops, hold on, um, Dr. Scheel was the Surgeon General at the time, and as more information pot came in, Dr. Scheel basically uh, said, we're halting all vaccine production, shutting it down, and recalling everything. So, major problem. And um, Dr. Scheel and folks from the Center for Disease Control um, in Atlanta at that time, they also were investigating it as well, and they came to the same conclusions as Dr. Eklund and Dr. Hadlow. And then the federal government um, went in and put in strict regulations in terms of ensuring that any vaccine that went, went out was safe. So uh, the Cutter incident is one of the, one of the uh, we've had a couple vaccine-related incident, incidents, but it's one of the worst that happened, particularly related to, um, and it's a kind of a fortunate lesson learned. Um, overall, there were 200 cases of polio from Cutter vaccine. Um, there were 11 deaths. Um, we had one case here I could, that I, as far as we can tell in Montana, and it's a weird case, but it was a, um, an adult from Missoula who probably likely got it from getting, he probably had his two-year-old daughter vaccinated, and then she had a mild infection and she spread the disease to him. He became infected and then got um, uh, paralysis. So. so finally, they halt and recall the vaccine put in safety measures, retest everything, and then they get back on track. And so I just want to come back here again. So that, as you can imagine, kind of started to jam things up in terms of the uh, potential fear in communities about the vaccine and um, made it a big challenge for public health to actually start get, getting people immunized. So, and there definitely was a struggle here in Montana. By 1956, only 21% of um, eligible people were, um, had been immunized for polio, but they persevered and over time um, um, they pushed and got more people vaccinated. So by July of 1958, about 60% of eligible people here in Montana were um, immunized for polio. And then um, the last couple things I want to share with you was um, talk a little bit about the kind of the end game for polio. So in 1958 was the last epidemic of polio in Montana. And as you can see, then it goes down to pretty much zero. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that last epidemic. So the last outbreak of polio was on, on the Blackfeet Tribal, Blackfeet Reservation, north of here. Um, on July 9th, 1958, there were nine cases of polio reported from the reservation. And in a response to that, um, the public health officials in the Indian Health Service um, implemented a mass vaccination program for the entire community. And within, uh, I think it was two or three days after those cases were reported, they had about um, two-thirds or about 6,000 um, uh, folks in the Br Browning community immunized against polio. So they kind of dove in totally. Um, there are a couple things that happened again was because of the concern of spread among kids and adults, um, they canceled the North American Indian um, um, Indian Day celebration in Browning. So they didn't want people congregating. Um, but with that push for mass vaccination, actually, it, it um, ended the outbreak in Browning, which was good. All told, they had 16 cases reported, and by the end of August, they had 90% of the community immunized, so they were protected. So that was the last polio epidemic in Montana. Um, 
So just a couple things in conclusion. Um, so between 1913, coming back to this timeline again, 1913 through the 1970s, um, um, in 1971, we had our last cases, we had the last two cases of polio in Montana and the last death. Um, so it's been 50 years since we had an acute case of polio or an acute related death from polio, which is pretty spectacular. So over this whole time period um, that of the 20th century, we had almost 3,000 cases of polio reported to the state and local health departments and about um, 320 deaths during that time. And then during the decade after the trial, public health, both local and state, made a lot of um, advances in getting more and more people immunized. So by 1964, about 70% of the eligible population in Montana was immunized of kids who were less than 15. And today, our polio vaccination rates among um, toddlers is about 93%, so pretty good. So just to finish, I just want to kind of finish with a few thoughts and kind of put this in perspective. So again, it's been almost 50 years since Montana's had its last um, cases of polio. Um, and I think for many people today, it might be difficult to understand a community's fear regarding the disease or the level of anticipation um, and then relief once there was an effective vaccine that was available. And I think few of us today, I mean, for me, for certain, have experience, haven't experienced summers where they close the pools or theaters or they um, uh, cancel the circuses to, uh, as a way to prevent um, the spread of a disease. And I think that with polio, polio is kind of a spectacular example. It really started with the leadership of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and then his, his ally, Basil O'Connor. They had the vision and they put the vision into action. And then they raised, then they worked with volunteers across the United States and communities to raise millions and millions of dollars to treat kids and then develop a medical research agenda to develop the vaccine. The other thing for me that really strikes me is the, um, this would never happen today, I don't think, but the public involvement in that trial was the key of why it was successful. And um, it would be, you know, it'd be, if we could pull this off today, I, uh, I don't think we can, but it was pretty spectacular to see community members coming together to do that. And then the, the other thing was raising all that money. I mean, they were raising nickels and dimes. And so they, you know, through raising nickels and dimes across the United States, um, put it, uh, raised enough money to treat kids all across the U.S. and then develop the vaccine. And I think the other thing, um, I don't know if we have any polio pioneers here today. If we do, um, thank you. Um, just hats off to all the kids and their parents who volunteered for the trial. This, these aren't Montana kids, but this is um, some of the campaign material for it, just showing off their arm where they had the bandage. This is the uh, button that all the kids got. Um, one of my co-authors, Dr. Helgerson, um, he's our former state medical officer. He was a polio pioneer when he was growing up over in Seattle. So he can't find his button. It's in a box somewhere in his attic. Um, but he believes he, um, and this is the card that all the kids got signed by Basil O'Connor. Um, so it's pretty, pretty spectacular. So I think I'll end there. And again, just a, um, I have copies of the article, which has a lot more information. And then if anybody's interested, there's a list of all the kids who got vaccine. It's sorted by county and by school. So um, please help yourself to that. So thank you. And any questions? Any polio pioneers? I didn't see anybody raise their hand out here. No, nope. okay. Go ahead, sir. Where did, where did polio originate? Um, that's a great question. So I don't know. It's oh, been... It's oh, so the question... Yeah, thank you. Um, where did polio start? So based on the stuff we've read, it's been around since ancient history. I mean, it was in um, the Middle East, but Is it's... anything tied to the Spanish influenza? With polio? Well, the question was, was anything tied with the Spanish influenza with polio? No, no. Totally separate virus. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, 
Or to get. Yeah. Yeah. So the it's more of a comment, but it's kind of the the comment was about, and that's actually. Let me go to the next slide. Did it look like this? Yeah. So basically, the comment was about. Um, in the 50s and 60s about school immunization clinics and then getting mobilized again. This is not from Montana. This is from, I think, Kansas City. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people experience that as well. I think the individual I was talking to earlier too. So, Go ahead. So the question was, is there a correlation between summertime and polio? And I think with uh, polio being an enterovirus, and then um, and one of my colleagues is here, Dr. Holtzman, he might chime in on this question if I get it wrong, so let me know if I get it wrong. But I think um, polio was, a, why was it more of a summertime virus? Because it was more likely to proliferate during warmer weather. You know, like an example would be influenza does better in cold weather. It, it can... Um, um, uh, propagate itself and spread better in cold weather. Cold weather and polio was more of a summertime um, disease. Although it, there were sometimes cases in December and January, but the big peaks for the epidemics were generally in um, midsummer and fall. And I think, too, just a comment, um, you know, the thing we work, we're kind of are concer always concerned with, but more concerned lately is, you know, kind of the never-ending um, anti-vaccination movement. Um, and so, you know, there have been, you know, polio, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but polio is down to, it's only found in countries where there's lots of political strife, where an example, it's, it's kind of like with Ebola virus, um, where public health workers and providers are putting their life at risk trying to get into areas to um, immunize people. So examples, I think, are Pakistan. Um, but the concern was, I think, a couple months ago, there was a polio case in the Philippines. Of um, So it's like, you know, we got to be vigilant and make sure. That's why, you know, I talked about our current immunization rate for um, kids from 18 months to 35 years, 35 months of age, our pol polio immunization rates around 93%. So to protect the whole community, you got to have um, immunization rates in the 90 plus, um, particularly for measles. It's got to be even better. So, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um. Actually, oh, the question was, did, uh, was polio's early death associated with, um, or was FDR's death associated with polio? I'm not sure. I, yeah, he, I know from what I've read, he struggled to uh, recuperate, um, and he never fully recuperated. Um, there's, um, in some of the books I've read about him, he, uh, he, I mean, he tried to show a kind of a courageous front window, but he would be at the podium, you know, with his hands on, on it, holding on, and his braces on. So I, my guess is it potentially had some effect on uh, shortening his life. With his lungs <coughs> Excuse me. The question was, was when FDR became ill, um, was his were his lungs affected? I, from what I've read, no. He mostly had lower extremity paralysis. He never um, had to be uh, put in an iron lung or have that respiratory support. Um, but he had significant um, um, leg paralysis, and then he worked for years to try to rehabilitate himself. Yeah, I think there's a question here. Yeah. 
Oh, that's pretty cool. The, co it's, the comment was uh, how a family member or uh, a sibling was affected and then how um, the parents actually supported the March of Dimes for pretty much a lifelong commitment. So, And that theme was in here um, where parents, um, after they got through, hopefully when, when their, their children survived the infection, but um, they, the same thing happened is they, they, found, they found a cause, kind of like FDR. They found a cause and they saw how it could help um, help particularly kids. FDR was really concerned about kids and um, his speech from his um, birthday ball was, I couldn't, didn't have enough time to include it, but some of the quotes in there about helping restore kids to become part, part of, a, uh, part of uh, our community again, particularly back in that time when um, kids with disabilities were really looked down on. So, so I appreciate that comment. Yeah. One of the things that I remember going through this time, and one of the things that they talked about constantly, that was never a lesson in America. And this, this was maybe kind of a selling point to get people ready to assist in the day. Absolutely. So the question or comment was about um, how for kids and adults who um, got infected and had significant complications or had to be treated in iron lung, um, how that kind of drove the community to get immunized, I would totally agree. And they used those images to you know, promote it. Um, the funny thing, I, I know I got some questions when we were working on the paper, I got questions from Laura Ferguson and the staff here who were reviewing our paper about, you know, was there any anti-vaccination um, push against the polio vaccine during this time period after the Salks vaccine was um, created. And then in the mid-60s, Albert Sabin created a second vaccine. Some of you probably got that. Um, it was the sugar cube vaccine. Um, so, but from what we were able to look at, you know, it was nothing like we have today where we have a subgroup of folks basically kind of using um, misinformation. But back then, I, I couldn't find anything in the newspapers, any commentary. People were on board because they were so scared they did not want their kids to be paralyzed or die. Um, so it was a pretty amazing um, charge. Well, we saw yeah. evidence of that all through elementary school. There was at least one child Crippled, in yeah. every class I was in that had had polio and wore braces or couldn't walk at all. Yep. And in these brownie stocks, they took us to show there for a field trip, and we saw the iron lung. I mean, the girl that was in my class who had had polio said she had to spend time with That's pretty cool. Yeah. I guess sometimes the muscles do recover from that. Yeah, through treatment, but not everybody. But they do um, immense, kind of intense physical therapy to get kids back. And some of those, like these pictures here, um, this little gentleman, I think he's a, he's American Indian, but there were pictures of him. Um, they're going through and doing rehab at, at Shodair Hospital, and I'm guessing he got back some or most of the mobility. So yeah, they didn't have to persuade us to have the shot. We knew what the only yeah. thing was. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So um, the question was, was Albert Sabin's vaccine as effective as um, Jonas Salk's vaccine? And um, I'll throw out my thought, and then I'll have my colleague correct me if I'm wrong. So the reason why they switched, so Jonas Salk's vaccine was a killed virus. So they basically used chemicals to actually kill the virus, but the virus, if you got immunized, you, your body would recognize it, you couldn't infect you, and then you'd develop antibodies to protect you. Sabin's vaccine was attenuated, so what that meant was it was still a live virus, but it was attenuated where you may have some infection, but it will be a modest fever and those kind of things. You won't go on to develop paralysis in that. And as far as I know, I think the, effect, the effectiveness was equal, pretty close. Salk's vaccine was like 80 to 90 percent effective. And I think they switched in the later 60s to solely using Sabin's vaccine um, because it was overall thought to be, it was effective and thought to be safe. And then they switched again in the 1990s back to Salk vaccine um, because there was the one problem with Sabin's vaccine was, it was a, and I think I was talking to Kirby about this, it was really rare, but because it was an attenuated virus, um, Sometimes, you know, a child would take the vaccine and 
they would have a moderate, modest infection, but they would develop antibodies. But sometimes the child would start to excrete virus, and then an adult or somebody else would get exposed, and the virus would kind of become more um, severe. And the, a, per, a secondary person who got exposed to that individual would get infected and develop symptoms of polio. So that's when they switched back in the 90s to, because it was like rare, it was like one in a million, but it was enough to say we don't want this to happen. Second. Other questions? Anything? Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, again, help yourself. There's copies of the paper and some um, the list of uh, Montana's polio pioneers up here. So, thank you. <laughs>